the names that's ascribed to him in the book of the Revelation is faithful. The Bible says all the promises in him are yea and amen. Anytime you read one of those 5,000 promises in the word of God, you can say yea, amen, Lord. You do exactly what you said that you would do. I'm glad this morning to know him. I hope that you do. Today would be a good day to get acquainted with him. Never met one like him, have you? I mean, he's the one that will be with us. When nobody else seemingly even knows what we're going through, he'll be standing right by our side. I want to welcome you this morning to Batley Baptist Church. What a joy it is to have you today, especially those of you that are our guests that are visiting with us. We do want you to feel welcome because you are welcome. Uh, I've heard and probably been guilty of saying, now make yourself feel welcome. We don't want you to make yourself feel welcome. We want uh, ourselves to make you feel welcome. We want, to know, want you to know that this is a place that has opened its doors for you to come, and we're so glad that you're here. I'm going to ask uh, our ushers. They've already up here to this morning. Let's bow our heads. Would you stand with me? Let's ask the blessing upon the offering today. Father, you have been so faithful. Lord, there's no way that we could ever thank you enough. Lord, certainly we couldn't repay you. Lord, for all the things that you've done in our life, Every promise that you've ever made us, Lord, it's held true. We ask today, Father, that you'll bless each and every person that's in this building. Bless this offering, Lord. May it be used for your glory. For all the things, Lord, that we come before you this morning with, Father, we ask in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you remain standing and help the choir to sing as we receive the offering? in my class and a lot of you didn't get to come to my class though or to Sunday school at all so I want to try to sing something 139 the title of the song is You Are With Me but it's taken right from Psalm 139 I hope I can get through it I want you to know how special you are today Oh. 
I, I'm amazed at how the Lord works. Connie was showing me the songs that she was going to sing tonight, and she talked about how that uh, Lee was going to preach on that same subject. And then the McCamies got up and sung that song from Psalms 139. And on my way to church this morning, God laid that scripture on my heart. And I opened up to it and read it on my way to church. And, uh, he works all things together. He puts everything right in its rightful place. And I'm thankful for that. We're looking in Luke chapter 19. I want to make mention to you that we have this bottle up here. This is not for our deacons. <laughs> this is for the Choices Resource Center, No Cridge. Today is the Sanctity of Life Day. Since 1973, 54 million babies have been aborted. Literally, they've been killed in their mother's womb. I was on my way home last night uh, with Sean, and I was talking about preaching the Word of God, and I was reminded of what Jude said. He, he said, speaking uh, the, word in, the Word in truth. And, uh, what's that, Lee? What is that scripture? Speaking in Jude. Anyhow, I'll get to it in a minute. I'm glad you didn't remember because it'd make me look bad, Lee. <laughs> Speaking the truth in love. That's it. But I was thinking about that. I, I haven't changed my mind on hot topic issues like abortion. I still believe that that child is the creation of God. I've been preaching that since I started preaching. I believe abortion is murder. But at the same time, I also realize that they some ladies that have made that decision that regret that decision. And I would never want to uh, try to embarrass anyone, but to let you know that our God is a forgiving God. And no matter what we've done, He will forgive us if we'll ask Him. And I want to speak the truth in love. I, I don't want to back up. I, I don't want to uh, give up. I, I, I want to stand up, be faithful to the Word of God, and preach it just like it is written but at the same time, I want you to know that God loves you. No matter what you've done, God loves you. Sanctity of Life Day, 1973, a lady by the name of Norma McCorvey was about to get a divorce from her husband. And she was faced with the decision as to whether or not to abort her child. They used that in Texas. They used her. In fact, she is what is known as Jane Roe in Roe versus Wade. She was the one that was used for that case that was taken before the Supreme Court. After that happened, ten years later, she let it be known who that she really was. She worked in the abortion clinics. But she watched as Operation Rescue, as those folks stood outside the abortion clinics and uh, tried to share the love of Jesus Christ. She noticed how kind that they were. That they didn't try to embarrass the women that were coming to the abortion clinic, but that they were kind to them, just sharing with them the love of Jesus Christ and letting them know that that child that they had in their womb was the creation of God. And she was so moved by that, she began to attend their meetings and begin to attend church and was saved by the grace of God. She quit the abortion uh, clinic work and she started working to uh, try to lift up pro-life, the pro-life agenda. And that's what she's doing today. I'm glad that God can change a life. He can make a difference. And I want to look at a man that God made the difference in his life. Would you stand with me as we look in God's Word Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Very familiar scripture. In fact, I look back on my notes. I preached this a year and a half ago, but to make sure that I was going to give you fresh manna, I didn't look at any of my notes. I want to make sure that I got a fresh word from God because God laid this message on my heart. And, and, and so what I'm preaching to you today, it's not warmed over. 
It's fresh from heaven. And so let's look in God's word together. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day of salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, use us today for your glory. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my Redeemer, I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I doubt that anybody in this room hasn't heard the story, or at least the song about Zacchaeus. It's one of the favorite songs of our children. In their Sunday school classes, they learn about Zacchaeus. I guess they relate to it because they're all short, just like Zacchaeus was. But we know the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior came that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. I want to look just a little closer at that encounter that Zacchaeus had with Jesus. I thought a lot about him this week. It's been on my heart seemingly almost constantly. But you know, in a sense, I want to preach on this thought. A sinner treed in a sycamore tree because in a sense, that's what happened to Zacchaeus. He was treed in a sycamore tree. Some of you older men, maybe some of you younger men are coon hunters. I know Junior Phillips is a coon hunter. In fact, I spoke to a man at Ace Hardware a few years ago, and he said he made the mistake of going hunting with him one night. And Junior, of course, was much older than this young man was, and he thought, I'll be able to keep up with him. But he said he just about uh, drove me into the ground, said, I'll never do that again. But a coon hunter, they're determined that they're going to pursue that coon until they tree it uh, in a tree. Our Lord this morning, like the coon hunter, he pursued after Zacchaeus until he treed him in a tree. That's what he talks about in verse number 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. To seek and to save, that's what he done in Zacchaeus' life. Another great example of that is the story about how the Lord left the ninety and nine sheep and went after that one that had gone astray. This Bible story about Zacchaeus is not just about a man that's up a tree, even though that is the literal take on this story, but it's much deeper than that. It concerns the love and the concern of the Savior that came to deal with a man that had found himself so deep and steeped in sin. And in this story, we see the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ to help anybody, to save anybody without regard to their station in life. The story of Zacchaeus, first of all, I want you to notice, it illustrates the problem of him meeting the Savior. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's no problem on Jesus' part. But there was a potential problem on Zacchaeus' part. There could have been a problem, first of all, with his social status. The Bible says in verse 2 that There was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. He held a very high position. The Bible says that he was chief. Publicans were tax collectors. The Roman government had taken over Israel. They had taken over uh, the, the children of God. They were under subjection to the Roman government. And they hired Jews to go out and collect taxes. And sometimes these tax collectors, in fact... Most of the time, if not all the time, they took more than was required. And, and they uh, lined their own pockets with that that they, had extor- that they had exhorted from 
the people. Zacchaeus was not just a publican. He was the chief among the publicans. In our vernacular, we would say something like this. He he was over the IRS. And you know as well as I do that he was hated. I, I, I don't care much for him today, do you? I really don't. There's no doubt that Zacchaeus was a very wealthy person. And it indicated that he would do anything that was necessary to get his hand on another dollar. Just to get a little bit more. Uh, He was willing to uh, sink himself to any depths of depravity just so that he could become wealthier. You know, that's the problem with a lot of folks today. The trouble with too many people... They're spending too much money that they haven't yet earned for things they don't need to impress people they don't even like. That's the problem with our world today. One of the problems, he, he's a man with a high position. He's chief among the publicans. He's also a man of many possessions because verse number 2 said, and he was rich. And he was rich. He's a man that has a lot of possessions. Now, don't let that... Uh, cloud your thinking on what the story is dealing with. It's not saying by any means that a rich person cannot be saved or uh, that uh, they're somehow in a class by themselves and God can't reach them. Because Acts 10 and 34, in, in Peter's dealings with Cornelius, that Gentile, remember what God said to Peter? He said, for God is no respecter of persons. I, I know of a lot of folks that are very wealthy. A lot of folks that uh, are very well off, and yet some of those folks are are the most deeply committed folks to Christ that I have ever known. I I heard the story, in fact, I read it maybe a couple of weeks ago, about two men that were stranded on an island. One of them was exceedingly rich, and and the other uh, didn't have uh, very much, and the rich man, he just reared back and leaned up against a tree like nothing had ever happened, and smiled and just very content with the situation that they was in. And the other man looked at him and he said, how in the world is it that you can be so calm and so happy knowing the situation that we're in? He said, well, it's like this. He said, I I make $100,000 a week. I tithe on that $100,000 and my pastor is going to find me. (laughs) Oh, dear friend. Remember this, though, that money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. That there are some folks that don't have money, and yet they uh, consume their lives with seeking after it. That's the only thing they're interested in. God has no place because uh, they're always trying to get a little bit more. That's what Nelson Rockefeller said one time. said, how much money will it take to make you content? He said, just a little bit more. It's always just a little bit more. Last Sunday night, Lee preached on the rich man that tore down his barns and built up new barns and said to his soul, Now soul, uh, take uh, your rest, take ease, and uh, take your rest because you've got these goods laid up for many years. Remember what Jesus said about that man? He described him in, in Luke 18 and verse 21 as one that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he goes on in uh, Luke 18 and 24 said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? Pastor Henry that is famously known for that phrase, Give me liberty or give me death. Once said concerning uh, true riches, he said, I've now disposed of all my property to my family. There's one more thing that I could wish that I could give them and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that and I had not given them a single shilling, they would have still been rich. And if they had not that, and I'd give them all the world, they would still be poor indeed. Oh, dear friend, for those that have no time for God because they're seeking after the things of this world, they're in the same condition that Zacchaeus was in. He was a very rich man. And at least for the uh, prior portion of his life, he had never sought after the things of God. But things are about to change. We see social status. That could have been a problem. Then secondly, I want you to notice his short stature could have been a problem. In verse number number three, 
And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. I I believe that his physical shortness represents his inability and his insufficiency in approaching a living God. Please don't miss the Holy Spirit's take on this detail about him being short in stature. The only way Zacchaeus could uh, meet the Lord was go to go to the sycamore tree. Now, sycamore trees, uh, I had a picture of one, tried to get it to Bradley. I was going to show you a picture of it. And uh, they're not like the sycamore trees that we know around here. Literally, they're, they're a fig tree. But it's not the fig trees in Israel that gives sweet fruit. It's the fig trees that gives bitter fruit. I believe that's representative uh, of the bitterness in Zacchaeus' life. Nobody loved him. In fact, everybody hated him. I believe he's a bitter man. Something drastic is going to take place in his life that's going to change him forever. The Bible says here that he climbed up into that tree. We wonder, how could a short man climb up into a tree? Well, if you see the pictures of those sycamore trees that are in Israel, you'll understand that first of all, their limbs are very close to the ground and they're easy to climb. And so it it was accessible uh, to Zacchaeus. That tells me this morning concerning the salvation of the Lord that God has put His salvation on the lowest limb so that anybody can reach it. It's a whosoever gospel. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Nobody's left out. Nobody's exempt. We all have access to the throne of God's grace. Oh, dear friend, I'm thankful for that whosoever salvation, aren't you? It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You can be saved this morning. God can save your soul by trusting Jesus, His finished work on the cross of Calvary. That's the only way for one to be saved. Listen, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and 24, who his own self bear in his own body on the tree, our sins that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. Zacchaeus was a short man, but that wasn't his real problem. We read in verse number 7 that Zacchaeus is a man that is a sinner. Doesn't that fit all of us today? Haven't we all sinned to come short of the glory of God? The Bible teaches us that, uh, that I, the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The same man that we read about that was a sinner in Luke chapter 19 applies to all of us. We all are sinners. None of us are exempt from that. He's a man that is a sinner. It's not his shortness of stature, though, that kept him from being saved. It's his shortness of spirit. God has to deal with his heart. Oh, there's good news for those today that find themselves spiritually short. Isaiah 59 and verse number 1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that He cannot save. He's able to reach us no matter how deep and steep in sin that we may be. Again, Luke 19 and 10, He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. Our Lord is looking for you today. He's pursuing after you. We look at the potential problem of His meeting The Savior. Then I want you to notice, second, the place of his meeting, the Savior. I remember the place where I met the Lord to you. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the day when I bowed on my face before a holy God and invited him into my heart, and he saved my wretched soul. I'll never forget that day. We see the place of his meeting, the Savior. First of all, Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see the Savior. Verse number 40, he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree. To see him, for he was to pass that way, wanted to get acquainted with Jesus. But you see, it takes more than knowing about Jesus to be saved. You've got to know Jesus to be saved. It's more than a historical Jesus that you need to know about. It's a personal Jesus that you need to be acquainted with. Zacchaeus, the Bible says he ran to see him, climbed that sycamore tree because he was to pass that way. But a person has to repent of their sins and receive Christ into their heart. Invite Jesus to come and abide with us. Jesus wanted to abide with Zacchaeus. Verse number 5. And Jesus, when he came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. You know, the Lord already knew where Zacchaeus was. He didn't have to go looking for him. He already knew. That's the reason I was looking at that verse this morning that they sung about. Psalms 139. The Lord knows where we're at. 
Verse 7 through 10, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If, my, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand hold me, and thy right hand shall lift me up. Oh, he knows where we're at. Job said in Job chapter 23, he knows the way that I take. He knows where we're at, doesn't he? He knew where Zacchaeus was. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to meet the Savior. That's the only way you're ever going to meet him. You're going to have to humble yourselves. The Bible says in John 14 and verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said to Zacchaeus? I must abide at thy house today. And Jesus tells us in John 14, if you'll trust me, invite me into your heart, repent of your sins, we'll come and we'll set up our abode in your heart. Revelation 3 and 20 says, he stands at the door of our hearts and knocks and wants to come in. Be a guest in our heart, be a guest in our life. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to meet the Savior. That leads me to my most important part. Jesus was to hang on a tree to save the sinner. Zacchaeus not only climbed a tree to see the Savior, but Jesus was to hang on a tree to save the sinner. The cross is, uh, it was absolutely necessary for us to be saved. You cannot bypass the cross and be saved. A man one time was in New York City. He was looking for a, a club that was called the Gates of Hell. And he met a uh, policeman on the streets of New York. And he said, sir, can you uh, direct me to the nightclub that's called the Gates of Hell? And the policeman said, yes, sir, I can help you. He pointed over in a direction. He said, you see that steeple over there? He said, that's Calvary Church. He said, you go past Calvary and you'll come to the gates of hell. And that's exactly, dear friend, the truth for all of us this morning. When you go past Calvary and you don't stop to visit the Lord Jesus Christ, to invite him into your heart, you'll come to the gates of hell. There's no other options. Jesus was to hang on a tree to save the sinner. I think it's very interesting that in the previous chapter, the Bible says in Luke 18 and verse 31, He took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man must be accomplished. For he must be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit upon, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus said, Right before he uh, met Zacchaeus there in that sycamore tree, he said, we've got to go to Jerusalem because I've got to accomplish my Father's will. I'm going to go to the old rugged cross. And the Bible says in John chapter 14, or chapter 3, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the, in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then he goes on in John 12 and 32 and says, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Oh, dear friend, he was to hang on a tree to save the sinners. That's why he went to the cross. I want you to notice thirdly. uh, I want you to notice the proof of his meeting the Savior. Somebody that's met the Lord, there'll be a difference in their life. They won't be the same as they was before they met him. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What's become new? First of all, we've got a new uh, perspective of Jesus Christ. He's not just a Savior now, He's our Savior. New things, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Changed life will always bear witness through a change, or a changed heart will always bear witness through a changed life. We'll be new creatures, we'll be different. Paul said, the things I used to hate, I love them now. Things I used to love, I now hate. He said, He's changed my life completely. Mel Trotter was a drunkard. Went through 17, I believe it was, different places of of living. Finally ended up in the worst part of town, living in a little basement, a dirty part of town. Very, a wicked part of town. He drunk his, every paycheck that he could get, he drunk it up in, in, in alcohol. Had a little boy that died. and And the story about Mel Trotter was, is that, Instead of trying to help that little boy to get the medicine that he needed, he spent that money on alcohol. Was drunk at his own son's funeral. 
decided that he was going to kill himself. Started toward one of the lakes there in Michigan, one of the Great Lakes, to drown himself. And on his way, he passed by this little mission. Somebody outside said, Sir, why don't you come in and get warm? Mel Trotter left the streets and walked into the building and sat on the back seat. And they began to sing and about Jesus and began to preach about Jesus. And Mel Trotter gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of committing suicide, he gave his life to the Lord. Became the director of those rescue missions. Many of them was the, the director and helped many men to find the same Jesus that he found. I'm telling you, dear friend, when you meet the Savior, your life will be different. You'll no longer be the same. See, the proof of his meeting the Savior. I believe, first of all, the actions of Zacchaeus proved that he'd been saved. Listen to verse number 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Given is a brand new experience for Zacchaeus. He's never been known as a giver. He's always a taker. But remember, he's a new creature now. He's different. Would you notice, if I have taken anything by false accusation, really that word means since. Since I have taken things by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus was admitting that I have extorted money. I've taken things by false accusation. Whatever. In the Old Testament, there's a penalty for extortion. Exhortion. There, there's a penalty for that. Source it. The penalty is this, Leviticus chapter 6 and verse number 5. All they, all that about which he has sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereof. If you was caught extorting something from somebody, you had to pay back what you exhorted, and then you had to give 20% extra. I want you to notice, though, that's not what Zacchaeus does. He follows a different principle that is found in Exodus chapter 22 and verse number 1. If a man steal an ox or a sheep, and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Zacchaeus is saying, I, I'm much worse. It's much worse than me just I, I, exhorting, exhorting things from somebody. I have robbed people. And I'm going to pay the penalty of robbery. I'm going to admit what I've done. That's proof that he had been saved. He confesses his sins. And he admits, I'm a robber. I have robbed folks of what belonged to them. And he follows the principle of Exodus chapter 22, and verse number 1. The actions of Zacchaeus proved that he had been saved. Then lastly, the announcement of Jesus, more than anything, proved that he had been saved. Verse number 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now what's that mean? A son of Abraham. It's a reference to Abraham who God placed righteousness to his account because of his faith. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But how in the world is Zacchaeus the son of Abraham? How does those things connect? Well, Galatians 3 and 7 tells us. Knowing ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You know what that means for us this morning? We're a child of Abraham by faith. We're included in that promise that God made to Abraham. He said, Abraham, go out and try to count the, the little uh, sand pebbles on the shore of the sea. He said, I, I'm going to bless you to the point that your family is going to be more than all those put together. Or go out and try to count the stars. And see if you can count them. He said, I I'm going to give you a family that exceeds the number of the stars. I'm glad this morning that by faith I have been brought into the family of God. I've received the spirit of adoption whereby I can cry, Abba, Father. By faith, that's what made it possible. Oh, this morning, consider this man that was treed in a sycamore tree. He didn't have anywhere else to go. Jesus pursued him until he found him. You ever hear somebody say something like this? 
I remember when I found the Lord. I used to say that. I quit saying that. Lord never was lost. I didn't find him. He found me. I wasn't even looking for him on the day that I met him. But he was looking for me. And dear friend, he treed me. I believe he's treed some of you too. Found you. Pursued you. You know why he kept pursuing after you? Because he loves you. He didn't want you to perish, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. I'm convinced that God is pursuing somebody here this morning. I believe that with all of my soul because God gave me this message. And the message will not return void. It's going to accomplish what God intended for it to do. It's a message to reach those that don't know Jesus. The Lord is pursuing after you. I wonder this morning if you'd just stop and realize that he'll go to any extent to save your soul, even to the point of dying on an old rugged cross so that you could be saved. I wonder if you realize that today. I hope that you do. We're going to sing a song of invitation. But we're not the ones that are inviting you. The Bible says no man can come to him Except the Father which has sent him draws him. The one that gives the invitation is he the Holy Spirit that deals with our hearts. I believe that he's going to tree somebody here today. Going to find you right where you're at. In a lost condition, I believe there's somebody here today that needs the Lord. And then I believe there's some folks here this morning that are saved. But instead of being a stepping stone to help somebody that's lost to find the Savior, you've become a stumbling block. Because you have left the Lord, you have wandered like the prodigal, and no longer is your testimony the powerful witness that it once was. I wonder if you'd lead the procession of those that need to come to the altar this morning and make it easier for somebody else to come. If you'll come and get your heart right with God, it'll make it so much easier for that lost person that's in this building to slip out of their seat and to come. You know what I've discovered? I've discovered that among a lot of Christians, we want lost people to do what we won't do. We want them to repent, but we won't repent. I wonder this morning if God has spoken to your heart, you're saved, but you're not where God wants you to be. I wonder if you'll step out of your seat and come. And just lay your gift before the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm giving my life back to you. I want you to forgive me. Let's stand this morning as we sing together. <coughs> Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Oh, yes. And that thou <coughs> bidst me come to thee. I was raised in a Christian home. I, my dad was a preacher. My mom loved the Lord. She was a shouter. Seen her shout many times. Raised in that kind of environment. When I reached my teenage years, I became rebellious. Began to run from the Lord. You know, I could outrun my dad. I could outrun mom. I could do some things that got my mind off of them. And off, off what they was trying to teach me. But I discovered on that night in 1973 that I could not outrun the Lord. In an old-fashioned revival meeting, God began to pursue my heart. 
And I resisted him for just a little while. When the service was over and I was headed home, I discovered that the Lord was still pursuing me. I was still on my trail and he treated me right where you turn up to go to Frost Bottom. I turned to that church and I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've never regretted that. I'm so thankful that he didn't give up on me. That he kept pursuing me even when I tried to run as hard as I could to get away from him. He was hot on my trail. And I tell you, I've discovered in the years of knowing him that when I begin to stray and I begin to slip away from where I need to be as a Christian, that he comes after me. And he does not allow me to do anything that I want to do, go anywhere as I want to go, but he continually pursues me. He's treated me many times. I'm glad that he has. I'm glad that he didn't give up on me. I'm going to sing another verse of a song. I still feel like there's folks today that need to come and do business with our Lord. You know in your heart what you need to do. If you're lost, I believe that you know that you need to be saved. If you're out of fellowship with God, there's no doubt that you know that you need to get things right with Him. Maybe somebody here this morning that you know that God has been pursuing you about the place that you need to plant your feet in worship. And this is the place you've discovered. This is where God wants me. I, I know that God wants me to be at Batley. He wants me to part, be a part of this work. Whatever God is pursuing you about. I hope that you'll just stop dead in your tracks. And say, Lord, I'm not going to run anymore. I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with me, Lord, I belong to you. As we sing another verse of a song. Just